Greetings, my name is Randy Labonte from the Canadian eLearning Network, or CanEllearn as it's better known, and I'm coming to you from the land of the Shishalth, uh, situated on the Sunshine Coast of British Columbia, the just north of Seashelt, or Chatelich as it's better known. We're not sure what we'll be facing right now. The pandemic has caused a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, rethinking about how we might approach and still no clear path forward. What we can expect is that we'll either be five days per week in class, but that's not necessarily likely when you listen to what's uh, being planned right now. Or it could be some combination of part-time plus online. Or it could be, as in lockdown, online at a distance or remote learning <clears throat> five days per week the thinking around how we might be able to approach this really comes from our experience of not really using technology to drive education and learning, but the classroom and the connection with the teacher as being the primary driver to that where we were forced to be all technology at a distance. So we think that the balance really should lie somewhere in between with what we would call blended learning, where it's a mix of digital and online, as well as face-to-face -face in a class. So. This is not inconsistent with where we're actually going in K-12 education and education in general for that matter. So Microsoft <coughs> did a survey internationally and found that 61% expected to be in some kind of a hybrid learning environment or learning situation. More importantly though, 87% of the teachers polled indicated they expected to use more technology. Well, in actual fact, this has already been going on quietly in K-12 with a, a bridge towards a lot more technology infusion, but learning in digital learning environments and where teachers have leveraged that either whether they're located in a classroom or whether they're located entirely online, it's the blend of taking advantage of the physical space in class as well as the digital learning space that we can actually expand and improve our own practices. The critical question is, how do I teach in that? <clears throat> models. Models and theories that have shown and come to us through a lot of experience. We want to avoid this chaos that we had where we were trying to manage everything from one location, from one vantage point by one individual. And that's, yes, that's my actual office but back a few years back. We also want to avoid the first go-to that most people have is to just put content online. So take the text, take the assignments and put it in. It's what I call digital shovelware. We have learning management systems that have been built. They manage that quite well. We can track whether or not students have been involved with the materials, but it's really like spoon feeding and it's not necessarily a very effective pedagogical model. So <clears throat> when we start to look as well to the principles of learning, is that the cultures of belonging and sharing through story are critical elements in how students can learn, whether they be youth or adult. So the design and the pedagogy that we choose is absolutely the most important thing that we can manage and really need to take a critical look at. Within the context of what the research says is good, has been effective, and shows promise. So to me, I was a math and science teacher and I taught at secondary and then I got an elementary job in an elementary school and I figured out that really learning is all of these things and it's messy. I started to have chaotic classrooms but there was so much learning that was occurring in them. It was really really important to be able to structure in that and regardless of the pandemic Technology and e-learning and digital learning spaces provide us with that opportunity to actually be more creative, to address quality, to address individual and independent learning skills and requirements for students. Because once we publish everything in a digital format, we can use it here, there, everywhere. We can use it online at a distance. We can use it in a classroom. So it becomes where we put what we typically think of as our classroom into the cloud. So the important part though, is that we think of it from pedagogy, 
not technology. While technology can play an important role in learning, it alone cannot assure success. So the model which we've settled on, it, the Kenny Learn, and we've used in other jurisdictions as well, is the community of inquiry. It's a Canadian model. It was came out of Alberta and Athabasca University, and it is well researched across and used internationally. And it describes how you create a teaching presence, a cognitive presence, and a social presence. Too often in the digital shovelware world, we think about teaching as selecting content, providing opportunities for students to interact with it, and then get some feedback loop. So typically that's publishing assignments, having students engage with them, submit them, and they're evaluated or assessed by a teacher. That misses a whole significant part of what learning is all about. And that whole supporting dialogue, discourse, climate, the whole social interactions that occur that just seem to come naturally when we have students in a classroom. Much easier for us to structure, we're used to that but they can still be structured and created in the online environment quite easily. It's not unlike what John Dewey was saying for over a century ago when he was writing about the need for interaction as being a critical part of education and students constructing their own learning. It's not the rote paper and pencil kind of one room classroom situation. And even then Dewey was a leader and people are still trying to get back to what he was arguing for. But at the same time, we can look at the context in e-learning in Canada. And Tony Bates is one of our leaders who has been one of the founders in terms of the pedagogy and the theories around learning at a distance or in digital online environments. And he talks very significantly about the need for interaction between and among teacher and student, between students, but also student and content. Too often, we just look at the student and the content part and forget about the rest. So it's a really clear story about how this model fits. And, and fundamentally, it's our aim should be better, to be better than what we could be with just classroom or just online. It's how we can improve our ability to engage, to connect with, with our students through the use of technology. So the community of inquiry is a very useful model in terms of looking at social presence and the building of community as well. It's about how we build and construct learning and allow students, enable students, to construct their own learning. So as a teacher, I need to be deliberate in how I design, facilitate, and direct that learning to occur because I want to create personal and meaningful learning for each of my students. So the importance of social action cannot, social interaction cannot be, um, you know, dismissed. Is research conducted by Richard Light at Harvard found that students who studied in groups together were more prepared, better engaged, and learned more significantly than those that were not in groups. But also, other research has shown that student motivation, participation, the perceived and actual learning, and satisfaction and retention are all improved through social presence. Going back to the Indigenous principles, then learning is holistic, reflective, and experiential are part of what's core to that but they're also an ex exploration of one's own identity. So while it's social, it also needs to be independent and personal. So it goes back to those three things. Learning is personal, learning is social, and learning is interactive. So that's great, Randy. So how do I go there? How do I get from this, which I'm familiar with, to this, which has students both with me personally in place as well as online digitally at a distance. So how do I convert to this thing called e-learn? So it really what it does fundamentally shifts our thinking from a class in a room to a class in the cloud because I can bring the cloud into the room but I cannot bring the class out to the remote learners. So focusing on the and this is a screenshot of uh, Microsoft Teams environment, which can be accessible through a variety of different um, tablets and options and phones um, in, besides computers. So it's really important that we think about then what that does to our teaching, how we instruct. We don't stand at the front of a room and lecture. We then facilitate the engagement of learning 
in digital spaces that have been created. And if students happen to be in front of me, I will then work with them there to engage with that. So we shift our class time from lecturing to facilitating and supporting group and individual learning. So that's a pedagogical shift. And I go back to, again, the community of inquiry helps us to frame that, to understand that. So where can this happen? Anywhere. When can it happen? On my own time or a group time. It can be collaborative and synchronous, or it can be independent and individual. And the best approach combines both. So it's what we call blended learning. But how we get there is by making mistakes. We're not going to launch this perfectly. Our experience in terms of lockdown in the spring gave us some clues about what we might be able to expect or, or wish to plan for, but it's also the way that K-12 to uh, and adult learning is going. So we have to create a culture of ability to make mistakes, to be supportive, to take one step at a time in order to build improvement. So this is not a one-shot training. This is an all longer experience that needs to happen because the keys to successful student learning is quite simply, irrevocably, the teacher. So most of the metadata analysis that have occurred point to the fact that the quality of a teacher is the second most important attribute or determinant of learning after family background or your postal code, so to speak. And we start with, and successful programs have started with humanizing communication. It's the fundamental point in terms of everything, not content, not assignments, not marks and quizzes and tests the humanizing of the communication between and among learners, teacher and learner, but also the content within a community. So all of those are framed within the community of inquiry framework. And what's beautiful about this as well, there's a set of 34 questions that can be used by teachers to reflect on their own work, but also to be used to give to students to get a critical assessment of the success in terms of their own learning as well. So, I haven't talked about technology. Well, what about technology? Technology supports all that and is selected to support all that. So, the digital competency framework is really quite useful to tell us what types of technology need to be selected. And already through my interactions and meetings with some of your teams, the pedagogical team as well as the administration team, um, you've already got a good and healthy selection of technologies that will support all of those important pedagogical, instructional design approaches. So to me, really, how do we go from this to this? How do I convert? Is really about stepping forward in a planned and determined way. The SAMR model is probably one of the easiest ones in, within which to consider how to frame this. So the first time that I start to do something different and utilize technology, I will substitute. I will use technology to do the same thing as I did. So I will digitize my content. I will post it in an online cloud environment so students from anywhere can access it. So that's substitution. I haven't really changed how I'm going to use it. I'm still thinking I'm in the classroom. Then we move to augmentation where I go, oh, wait a minute. I can do this differently now. The way in which this was set up I would like to apply it differently. So we begin to augment. And then, no, I want to change it. I want to modify it. I want to redesign some of this task because it works better now that it's all in the digital domain for me to do it this way. And then finally, what we end up with is a redefinition where we allow for the creation of new tasks in this learning environment as we build confidence and success. That's going to take time for some well over the year of the next school year for others much more quickly, but our early adopters will help others as we move forward. So again, community of inquiry and SAMR can help us to understand how we can move forward with this towards this class in the cloud, towards the ability to be agile, flexible, and to be able to make changes as we move along. I thank you.